Okay, uh, thank you very much. So uh, uh, I want to uh, recall what we did last time. So, uh, so we define the notion of where P Panakian category, the metric tensor category. So it's a category over field. So we, we work over a field K, which is algebraically closed and uh, uh, its characteristic is P, which is positive. Uh, and uh, we define this notion, which means that there exists a, a fiber functor from C to where P. And uh, this is just the semi-simplification of representations of Z mod P. In particular, this contains uh, super Tanakin, and this contains Tanakin. And uh, what we, uh, I stated the result of uh, Poulimbier, myself, and Ostrich, uh, which says that uh, semi simple symmetric tensor category of moderate growth is a verb Tanakin. The, since such categories we can understand more explicitly because we could take the automorphism group of this F, and that's a, a fine group scheme in uh, this verb P. And then if we can develop some kind of Lee theory in verb P, we can uh, understand this category in a more explicit way. And we saw that every semi-simple symmetric tensor category, which is not too big, uh, is verb Tanakian. So that's a theorem. But the converse isn't, uh, isn't true. Uh, so verb Tanakian category, and even ordinary Tanakian category doesn't have to be semi-simple. So what I want to do is I want to have an if and only if statement to characterize categorically the categories which are uh, verb Tanakian. And for this purpose, I define a uh, Frobenius function for plus uh, from, uh, because there are a few different kinds of Frobenius functors and that's why this was a plus. So, uh, so if you have uh, an object X, so, so, uh, so we can take P tensor power of some object, let's call it V. Well, then it maps surjectively to the symmetric power, uh, but also, uh, this contains divided symmetric power. So this is uh, V to the P coinvariance with respect to the symmetric group SP. And this is V to the P invariance with respect to symmetric group SP. And we have the composite map and this map is called four plus. Sorry, uh, this, this map is called alpha. And then a definition, so four plus of V is uh, the image of alpha. Uh, so, for example, uh, if V is a vector space, then you can check that this four plus of V is just V1. It's Frobenius twist of V. I'll give you an example for P equal to. In this case, uh, so uh, V tensor V, uh, we can uh, write it uh, in a GLV invariant way. Uh, in a, 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 there is a filtration of length three. So there is a wedge to V on the top, there is uh, this V1, and there is wedge to V on the bottom. And then uh, symmetric squared of V is this thing, and gamma squared of V is this thing. Gamma squared of V contains a sub-module, sub-object, which is wedge two of V, and quotient is V1, and symmetric square of V contains a sub-object wedge two of V, and quotient uh, is, uh, sorry, contains uh, a subobject V1 and quotient is wedge two of V. So the map from uh, uh, gamma two of V to S two of V looks like this, that uh, we take this thing and we kill uh, this sub, uh, subobject and then we embed V1 as the bottom of this one. And uh, so in, uh, uh, in the category of vector spaces or any uh, tensor category that uh, uh, maps to that such a category, this functor is exact of course because any additive well so what you can check so uh, uh, proposition non-trivial proposition is this is an additive fund in particular for plus of x plus y close to four plus of x plus four plus of y and this is a little bit surprising because obviously these functors are not additive they are uh, polynomial functors of degree P, but uh, the image of one in the other is an additive functor. However, it is not uh, 
a k linear functor because these are polynomial functor of degree p so scalars get raised to power p and uh, therefore this is functor is not linear but it is twisted linear it sends lambda to lambda to the p which is an automorphism of our algebraically closed field the frobenius is automorphic it's twisted k linear and um, well any uh, additive functor uh, is exact uh, if your category is semi-simple so if your category is semi-simple or if it admits so so this functor of course commutes with symmetric mono, symmetric tensor functors uh, because well everything here commutes with them and uh, so uh, in particular it is exact on semi-simple category or any category that admits a fiber functor into semi-simple category because you can always compute it after applying your fiber functor so, uh, so definition C is uh, called Frobenius exact if the functor for plus is exact. Uh, and uh, so what we get is that proposition any verb P Tanakian category is Frobenius exact. Okay, in the theorem, we prove that the converse is true for categories of moderate growth. So the theorem was the same authors is C is verb Tanakin only if of moderate growth and Frobenius exam. So this is somehow end of the story in the sense that it reduces the theory of Frobenius exact categories to the theory of Lie groups and Lie algebras in uh, verb P, more precisely algebraic. Okay, so uh, any questions about this? This is co-invariance, which is the quotient of V to the P by the sum of images of one minus SI, where I, SI are uh, permutations of I and I plus one. The question. Which was uh, no, like which was the object which characterized first? Like did Frobenius exact functor, were they something of interest before Verpi Tanakin categories or was it the opposite way? No, no so, so Ostrich introduced the notion of Frobenius functor to prove uh, uh, this theorem. Uh, so he proved it for fusion categories, semi-simple categories with finally many simple objects. Uh, and then he realized that when this functor is exact, can be it's likely that one can generalize this proof. But um, it took us six more years to actually do the job. Other questions? Okay, so now uh, uh, the next question is, are there symmetric tensor categories of moderate growth, which are not super Tanakian, not uh, VRP Tanakian, or equivalently Frobenius exact? And the answer is yes. So there is a simple example in characteristic two, which in particular uh, is a, a counter example to the Lynch theorem in characteristic two. So this is a very simple example. What you do is you take H, which is polynomials in one var variable, uh, let's say x over x squared. So this is a Hopf algebra. It's co product delta x equals to x tens of one plus one tens of x. So this is the uh, Frobenius kernel for the additive uh, group. Of course, uh, representation. So we were going to take c equal to representations of h, and this category, of course, is Tanakian because it has a forgetful functor to vector spaces. However, we're going to change the commutativity isomorphism. So the commutativity isomorphism uh, of V tensor W will be W tensor V plus XW tensor XV. And so it turns out that this defines a, a symmetric braiding. And, uh, and this category is not uh, uh, where, P, uh, where two Tanakian, which is just ordinary Tanakian and not Frobenius exact. So what happens is the following. So what are indecomposables in this category? Well, there are just two. There is one, which is equal to K, and then a projective, which is, uh, which is H, maybe I should just call it H, which is, uh, I'm going to write it like this, one, one. So it's an extension of one by one. And so now uh, let us compute, uh, well, Frobenius of K is just K because it's just a vector space, but uh, what is Frobenius plus of H? Well, recall our recipe. So we have to compute the tensor product H tensor H. 
uh, and then this has a decomposition like this. One, well, I mean, basically it's just H plus H. There is a, a filtration. You can write a filtration like this. And I mean, it, it splits, but you can also write it this way. And then what, what happens is uh, metric square of H is this copy of H. So, so basically, uh, Maybe, maybe I should not draw this. So, so symmetric square of H is just H. So, so this is just, okay, so this is how it goes. One, one plus one, one. Symmetric square of H is one plus one. It is this thing. And uh, gamma squared of H is also one plus one. It is this thing. And so this means uh, that when gamma square of H embeds here, and then we project to this, we get zero. So this implies that Frobenius plus of H is zero. So we have this exact short exact sequence, one H one zero. And uh, when we apply to it, uh, this functor for plus, what we get is zero, one, zero, one, zero. So it is not left or right. So, uh, so therefore, this category is not uh, Tanakian, and it's easy to show in other ways too. Uh, but uh, so this is a counter example. And in fact, there are such examples, uh, similar examples uh, in uh, any characteristic. Let me try to sketch, but they're more complicated. And uh, let me try to sketch what they look like. Uh, so, uh, and for this purpose, let me remind you that we discussed that where P is the category of tilting modules over SL2 uh, of K modular uh, the negligible morph. Uh, now what are, but the question is uh, maybe uh, we can uh, take a smaller, so this is the largest ideal, uh, uh, largest proper tensor ideal in this category because the quotient is semi-simple. Uh, so there is no, for semi-simple categories don't have non-trivial tensor ideal. So, uh, but maybe we can take a smaller ideal. So what are tensor ideals in the tilting modules uh, over SL2K? Don't have to. So what is a tilting module? First of all, it's a direct sum in a tensor power of the two dimensional representation. So uh, an indecomposable module is called tilting if it's a direct sum in the tensor power of V where V is the two dimensional representation. And uh, then a tilting module is a direct sum of indecomposability. And so, uh, all right. And so, uh, uh, so what are the indecomposable objects? Composable tiltings where m equals zero, one, two, and so on. So they're classified by the same label as irreducibles, but they're much larger. And uh, okay, there is a formula for their character in the SL2 case, but already, but this is, well, for SL2, it is, uh, um, I mean, it's non-trivial, but possible to write down, but Already for SL3, there is no known uh, formula for, for the character in general. But we can say what the tensor ideals are. So, so there is a, so this module T, P minus one, which is the same thing as the irreducible module of uh, highest weight P minus one. So this is the P dimensional module. So it's a homogeneous polynomials of dimension P minus one. Uh, and uh, this is called the Steinberg module, denoted by still one. And uh, this ideal N is generated by this model, which means N consists of all morphisms that factor through. Uh, 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 so, so you take, uh, so, so what does it mean ideal? It's generated, N is an ideal generated by the identity morphism of this module. So we take identity morphism of this module, you're allowed to tensor it with any morphism and uh, compose with any morphism. And you take all the morphisms you get that way and they form a tensor ideal. And that's exactly this ideal N of negligible morphism. And all the T J, where J greater or equal to P minus one uh, belongs to, to this ideal. So that's why when we quotient, we, are, we remain only with T, T1 up to TP minus one, which become the simple objects of our real indicator. However, there are higher Steinberg modules, TP to the N minus one, 
which is also irreducible p to the n minus one. So this is homogeneous polynomials uh, in two variables of degree p n minus one. So this is a p n uh, p to the n dimensional module, and we can look at the ideal i sub n, which is generated by this nth Steinberg module. And so, uh, uh, so, so this means that it. Uh, uh, all morphisms that factor uh, uh, that, that generated by the identity morphism of uh, the Steinberg module, and then T i uh, for i uh, great, uh, j for j greater or equal than p to the n minus one uh, belong to this i n. So we have this i one, which is this biggest ideal, maximal ideal containing i two, containing i three, and so on. And, and this turns out to be all tensor ideals. So that's a theorem, which was proved by Kevin Coulombier. And, uh, uh, and so now we can take a quotient by, uh, not by I1, but for by this uh, more general tensor ideal. So we can take a representation uh, of uh, well, tilting modules for SL2K modula IN. And so let me call this verb tilde of p to the n. Um, the reason I write it with tilde is it uh, for a, so if, uh, so this is not going to be, uh, not an abelian category for p for, for n bigger than or equal to two. So when n equals one, we obtain semi-simple abelian category that was the semi-simplification of this category, but for n greater or equal to two, it won't be abelian. And except, uh, except when p equals, uh, uh, except when p, except when p equal n equals two. In that case, it by accident turns out to be abelian. Uh, but it has an abelian envelope. But we can enlarge it to make abelian so that, so it's going to be abelian and uh, enough projectives so that uh, t, P to the n minus one minus one, t to the p to the n minus two, uh, are in decomposable projects. And this uh, this is called so. So in particular, this uh, as an abelian category, where p to the n is just modules over the endomorphisms of uh, direct sum of these modules, p to the n minus one plus so on plus t to p to the n, n minus one minus one. But uh, the interesting statement is that uh, this category has a tensor product and it is a symmetric tensor category. And the way you make tensor products in this category is that extend it in the most obvious way. So, so you pick projective resolutions, uh, m p zero p one n q zero q one and then uh, take the tensor product p dot tensor with q dot. And one can show proposition, and it's a kind of miracle that uh, this is exact. This means we make a double complex and take the total complex. And this is exact in degrees t equals zero. And then h zero of p dot tensor with q dot will be called m tensor. So this functor is exact, it doesn't have derived functors. And then it uh, turns out, so when you have an exact tensor product, you may hope that your category is rigid, has duals, because that implies exactness of tensor products. And indeed that turns out to be the case. And so this is the category ver p to the n, and then uh, ver p to the n contains the subcategory ver p to the n plus, which is generated by tm where M is even. So uh, it is obtained in the same way, but from uh, modules uh, with even uh, subscript. Uh, and, and the proposition is for N bigger than two or equal to two, where PN plus and where PN are not tonight and not where P tonight, not for being used exactly which is the same as verb P to nothing, because it's obvious that these categories are of polynomial growth, of moderate growth. 
And uh, example, where four plus is uh, this rep H, which I discussed in the example before. And now, uh, well, uh, um, and, the, and these categories are also, uh, so, so these categories that we have considered before, vector spaces, super vector. So when we consider vector spaces, then there is something that we can't map there, which is super vector spaces. We considered things we could, could map to super vector spaces, found something that we can't map there, which is where Linda P. And um, so all these categories were uh, so-called incompressible. So category C, symmetric tensor category C is incompressible. Every uh, exact uh, symmetric tensor functor out of this category to another symmetric tensor category is uh, an inclusion of a tensor subcategory. Fully faithful embedding and image is closed under taking sub quotients. Previous proposition, you said that verb PN and verb PN plus are both uh, of moderate growth. Just to make sure I understand, it's you quotient all the way through uh, the I1 and then you, uh, you look at the growth there. Is that it? No, but already this category of uh, tilting modules has moderate growth. I mean, uh, it has everything is bounded by vector space dimensions. So, uh, no, it's uh, so definitely uh, it's easy to see that uh, mod it's moderate growth. Uh, and uh, like, for example, uh, constant for the TI could be taken to be the vector space dimension of TI. Ah, modules, thank you, modules. A dimensional modules over this algebra. This is a finite dimensional algebra. Uh, other questions? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, th that's the next thing I want to discuss. So all these categories, so first of all, proposition that all these categories were P to the N are uh, incompressible. And of course, work P to the N plus are also. Uh, and whenever you see an incompressible category, well, if you have a compressible category, you can take such functor which fails to satisfy this condition and take its image. And this is going to be smaller than this category. But if you have a category that's incompressible, the only choice you have is to de declare it to be target of your fiber functors and see if every category is where to P to the N. Uh, uh, so, so actually, uh, well, not every category is verb P to the N Tanakian because there is category verb P to the N plus one, which is not verb P to the N Tanakian. Of course, uh, then you can ask whether every category is verb P to the N Tanakian for some N. Well, then you can take, uh, you know, tensor product of uh, all of these, and this is not going to. So, but what you should consider is you should consider verb P infinity. So it turns out that they, they embed into each other. So ver p, p to the n can be embedded into ver p n plus one. So this is not completely obvious, but this can be done. Uh, and, uh, and then we can take ver p infinity, which is the union of all of your ver p to the n using these embedded. There is a conjecture. Every symmetric tensor category over k of moderate growth per functor to verb P infinity. We're pretty far from proving this. And if a category is finite, uh, which means it has uh, enough projectives and finitely many simples, we conjecture that it maps, well, this conjecture would imply that it maps to one of those verb P to the N. And you might ask, what is the N for which it maps? What is the smallest N for which it maps? If it's Frobenius exact, you can take it N equals one. Well, the conjecture is the following. So if you apply this Frobenius functor, uh, the, then you kind of land in a subcategory and then you can apply it again. At some point uh, you will end up, and this is something that you can prove, you will end up in a subcategory, which is Frobenius exact. And the number of times you have to apply Frobenius to end up in that subcategory should be this, this is called Frobenius order and it should be that end. But that's so far conjectural, and we don't know even how to prove this conjecture for n equals two. We don't know how to prove that uh, that every symmetric tensor category of moderate. Yeah, yeah. So I can show if I have a finite category, which means it's modules of a finite dimensional algebra, that um, you know, the, after several applications of Frobenius, it will end up in a subcategory which is Frobenius exact. Uh, and let's call the number of times I have to do that n. Then I conjecture that, n, that it lands in uh, 
uh, ver, uh, p to the n plus one. And uh, I don't know how to prove that. But, but I don't even know how to prove that a category which becomes Frobenius exact after applying Frobenius once lands in the very p infinity. So, so this is an open problem. This is, and if we know, have such a problem, this would be a really good analog of the Lin's theorem and characteristic p. And that would be somehow end of this. And I should say that these categories have a lot to do with conformal field theory if you deform them to characteristic zero. So uh, you can deform uh, the category of where p to the n uh, to p addicts to characteristic zero in such a way that uh, it will become braided and uh, will become uh, representations, semi-simplified representation category of quantum SL2 at the root of unity. And the root of unity will be e to the pi i over p to the n. The category arises, for example, from representations of affine cuts Moody algebra SL2 hat at level uh, p to the n minus two. Okay, this is just a comment. So I have not so much time left and I promise to talk about categories of non-moderate growth, which is another very interesting story. So let me define the category rep GLT, where T is, uh, so, so let's say K is the field of complex numbers or more generally characteristic zero, or characteristic zero, and T is, K, is in K. And so I'm going to define uh, this category of representations of GLT of invertible matrices of size T, where T is not an integer. This is uh, called the Deline category. So it was uh, defined in the paper of Deline and Milne, which I already quo uh, quoted as a counterexample to the statement that every uh, Tanakian, every, every symmetric tensor category is super Tanakian over complex numbers. But uh, later, the Lin realized that these categories are interesting and studied them systematically and also their analogs for symmetric groups and orthogonal groups. So let me define this category. So for this purpose, let us recall what is rep GLN. Let me call this rep underlying GLT because it's really not a classical representation category. So what is usual rep GLN C? So we have, uh, so this is what Joel explained. So we have V which is C to the N, which is the vector representation. And then uh, uh, every, so this is a semi-simple category and every simple object is a direct sum V to the N cross V star to the N uh, for some N and M, or actually I should uh, R and S maybe. And so it is enough to define morphisms between these. This is exactly the kind of categories that Joel was explaining the presentations of. Uh, so, uh, so how to write home from V to the R, V star to the S, to V to the uh, L, V star to the M. Well, so you denote uh, the so you the, so you have a picture, and the, at the bottom you have this uh, v to the r v, v start to the s. So you have r arrows going out, and s coming in, and uh, here you have uh, similarly uh, m arrows coming in, l arrows coming in and M arrows going out. Uh, and then you're supposed to connect, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so you have M going out. Uh, well, what you're supposed to do is, you, so you put a wall here, and then you're supposed to connect in such a way that you have nothing uh, uh, left. So for example, like that, like that, like that, uh, like this, this, and this. and. Uh, and so uh, all morphisms are spent by such pictures. And uh, when you, uh, well, at least, uh, so of course, when uh, this N is small, these pictures are linearly dependent, but when N is large, they are linearly independent. And also uh, uh, composition of morphisms. So tensor product of morphisms is obvious. We just put two pictures next to each other. And then composition of morphisms is concatenation. But when you concatenate, Two pictures, you may get loops which are not allowed in the original pictures. So, uh, so I'm repeating uh, 
Joel's class. So if you concatenate this picture with this picture, uh, you will get a circle. And then you have to delete circles. And, uh, and the rule is that the circle equals to T. So, so this is a, uh, and, and so, uh, so this gives you a category, at least with objects. So, so, we, def so we have a category. So this gives a monoidal category called rep underlined, let's scale, call it rep tilde of GLT. Uh, so objects are pairs, RS, morphisms are pictures, uh, and uh, uh, tensor product is putting pictures next to each other. Uh, composition is concatenation with circle equal to T. Uh, okay, so this is the category. For example, you, uh, we can compute the endomorphisms of RS. And as you might guess, this is the walt brouwer algebra from Mott's class, WRS of T where T is a delta parameter that was used in her class. And uh, so, uh, and then we can take the Karubian completion. So rep underlined GLT is a Karubian completion, rep tilde GLT. So this means that we are join direct uh, images of projectors. That's a standard pr procedure with any category. Other relation. Uh, in particular, in this category, we don't have uh, top exterior powers. We don't have determinants because there is no n becomes infinite, so to speak. Uh, and in particular, v star is not. That's why we have to use both v and v star because in GLN, if you are willing to sacrifice the determinant and just talk about SLN, it's enough to take just v. Every representation lies in the tensor power of v. But here, we really have to use both v and v star. And that's, that's more similar. So this category is actually, even though it's rep GLT, but it's more similar, and we will see why in a second, to super uh, group, GLMN, where really V and V star are two different worlds. Okay, and so uh, now, uh, and then there is the theorem, is if T does not belong to Z, then this rep underlined GLT is a semi-simple, Symmetric tensor category. Symmetric because you can switch pictures. Uh, so, and the proof is uh, uh, this follows from the fact, does not belong to Z, yes, follows from the theorem that was proved in Mod's class uh, is uh, that the Wald Brouwer algebra RS of T is semi simple for T does not belong to Z. Uh, simple objects are going to be just. Um, simple modules over the correspond to simple modules over this algebra. And uh, I should say that in a similar way, you can define, you can define rep ST. You should start with the permutation representation of SN. Then every representation belongs to, uh, is a direct summon in the tensor power of that representation. And so we have to describe only morphisms from, you know, V to the M to V to the N. And this can be described in, in terms of diagrams corresponding to set partitions. And then you can do a similar procedure. And then we get that, uh, uh, so, so we, this is gonna be generated by objects R and endomorphisms of this object R is going to be the partition algebra A to R. And partition algebras are semi-simple when T is not a non-negative integer as was shown in Mod's class. So this will imply that this category rep ST is a semi-simple symmetric tensor category for T not equal one, zero, one, two, and so on. And finally, we uh, can define the category uh, rep SPT underline. So in this case, again, there is a vector uh, representation, V, uh, and uh, then uh, home, uh, so everything is contained in a direct, in a tensor power of V. So uh, it's enough to describe home from V to the M to V to the N. And uh, that is given by ordinary Brouwer diagrams now, not Walt Brouwer diagrams. So, uh, so we will uh, have, uh, endomorphisms of V to the M, the Brouwer algebra. How was it denoted BM? BR of, and you might ask uh, me what happens 
And, and so this is semi-simple when t is not an integer. So, uh, uh, so this implies that uh, this category is semi-simple. T does not belong to Z. And you might ask me what happens uh, if, uh, all right. And so what happens when T is in Z? Uh, well, so let me start with GLT, uh, with ST. This is the easiest case. So rep ST, in this case, actually uh, T is in Z greater or equal to zero is an interesting case when we don't get a, a abelian category. We don't get a semi-simple category in this case, and we don't even get an abelian category because uh, the only uh, representations of this algebra we get are those which are direct summons in the uh, uh, representation on uh, in the standard representation. So not all modules over this algebra. And so it has an abelian uh, envelope. So this is one thing we, you can do, abelian envelope. So it is uh, similar to what we did uh, with verb P to the N. We added some objects. Uh, uh, so that the objects that we had before are more or less the tilting object. Uh, and you can do something like this here. Uh, uh, but another thing you can do, it has a tensor ideal uh, of negligible morphisms. You can, it's a, that's the only one, that's the only uh, non-trivial tensor ideal in this category. And then we can make a quotient, semi-simplification, and, uh, and, and this is just the ordinary representation category of ST. So the story is uh, quite simple. Now, uh, let me explain what happens if uh, uh, for FGLT. So first of all, uh, GLT is equivalent to rep of GL minus T uh, uh, twisted, which means we change the commutativity isomorphism. So we declare, so if we declare representation V odd and, and put parity, you will get from GLT, you will get GL minus T. So it's enough to say what happens for T greater or equal to zero. And uh, then uh, we can again, uh, well, there is again an abelian envelope. Uh, this was proved by uh, Enteva Eisenbad, Serganova, and Hinich. Uh, so there exists a abelian envelope. And in this case, it was proved by Ostrich. Uh, and also, we can look at the tensor ideals classified by Wilson. And those ideals, now there are infinitely many ideals. It's a chain of ideals labeled by po one positive integer. So it's very similar to tilting modules in characteristic P. So, so there is uh, uh, this category rep GLT underlined. It contains some ideal I1, which is just the negligible ideal. It's the largest one. This contains some I2. This contains some I3 and so on. And then you can take the quotient and this embeds into representations, ordinary representations of the supergroup GL of T plus M. M. It's not everything. So this is surjective only, surjective only for M equals zero. Otherwise it's not surjective. It only gives representations uh, that uh, are, uh, can be obtained uh, as a direct summand in a tensor product of V and V star. So not all represent, uh, in the, uh, sorry, direct summons, actually, sorry. Uh, which are sub, uh, maybe sub quotients of uh, yeah, tensor products of V and V star, something like this. So some subcategory. That's why it's more related to supergroups because when we start to take smaller ideals, then, then the structure is more and more like super levels, super groups. And uh, finally, what happens for orthogonal group or for symplectic groups, T and Z? Well, first of all, you might ask me uh, what happens for orthogonal groups? Why did I mention them? Because we obviously can also extend them well, it, it turns out that they are related to symplectic groups exactly in this way. Uh, so this is representation of orthogonal group twisted. And there is a minus T. This explains, if you've studied classical representation theory, you know that there are very many formulas for, uh, where you compute something for symplectic group, and then you set N, replace N by minus N, and it gives you the answer for the same problem for the orthogonal group. And that's exactly why this happens. And by the way, I should mention that orthogonal group is not 
you you have to use not SO but O the orthogonal group that is disconnected. So that, uh, uh, but but we don't have uh, uh, somehow the difference between O and maybe better to say that when you take that limit difference between O and SO is gets erased because we don't have determinant because we don't have the top exterior power. Anyway, so this is the picture. And now what, so we have to say what happens for T greater or equal to zero for, for SPT and OT. Well, there are abelian envelopes and also, well, there are some ideals, but we can look at the semi-simplifications. So for example, what is rep OT semi-simplified? Well, that's usual rep OT. Not surprisingly. And what rep SP T semi simplified? Well, this is rep SP T if T is even. And that's what happens when T is odd. Who knows? Yes. It should be I zero. Okay, so who can say what happens for odd T? There is no symplectic group. Who knows theory of representations of least super algebras? There is a family of classical least super algebras whose representation category is semi simple. And this is OSP of 2N1, 1, 2N. So this is going to be OSP representations of OSP of T minus one, one. And this is even number now, so this makes sense. Okay, so it's more or less time for me to finish. So I want to do the last thing. Certainly there, there is also a very interesting story what happens with these categories and characteristic P. And the most interesting thing that happens is the parameter T then becomes a p-adic integer instead of an element of your ground flu. And uh, I don't have time, this would require a separate lecture, so I don't have time to explain that, but uh, let me explain why these categories are not of moderate growth. So let me just take for an example, rep GLT, where T is not in Z for simplicity. Uh, and so to see that's not of moderate growth, it's enough to take endomorphisms of V to the N. So this is all pictures with N inputs and N outputs. So this is just the group algebra of the symmetric group, right? In general, if V is a vector space and this N is bigger than the dimension of V, it's going to be some quotient of that, which is called the centralizer algebra. However, in the Deligne category, we don't get a quotient, we just have this. And so this implies that the dimension of endomorphisms of V to the N is N factorial. But for every object X of a tensor category, well, of, a, of, a, of any category, of an abelian category, of an Artinian category, dimension of endomorphisms of X is obviously less than or equal than length of X squared. Because X is decomposed into Jordan Holder components XI and, uh, uh, and the morphisms of X is at most as big as in the morphisms of associated graded. And uh, then uh, we will get homes from XI to XJ, which are uh, one at most one dimensional. So it's at, at most this. And so this implies that the length of V to the N is uh, less uh, greater than or equal than the square root of n factorial. And this of course grows faster than exponential functions. So this is not of moderate growth. And so these categories are very nice. It's a separate story and characteristic zero. So they can also be constructed by using ultra products from model theory. And this can be, this is a powerful method that uses axiom of choice, but on the other hand, it allows you to construct such categories in an industrial way. And uh, in particular, construct them in characteristic P, which is much more difficult because in that case, these um, al centralizer algebras in characteristic P are never semi-simple. And uh, unless, so you have to, the point is that this parameter T will have to be in FP in that case. 
and uh, and then the algebras are not semi simple and uh, so you don't get an abelian category and you have to show that it can be, can be embedded into an abelian category and that's difficult but this ultra product method which was proposed by Deline allows you to do it efficiently in all these examples on the other hand it is difficult to analyze what you get so uh, the behavior of these categories and positive characteristic is still not well understood. Okay, thank you very much. Please. Yes. Um, so it's mentioned that there's some formula for um, characters of spoofing modules, but wasn't this done by Rich and Lorenzen? No, no, no. So, so. Uh, no, there is no uh, <coughs> explicit for formula. I mean. Uh, uh, tilting modules are even harder than irreducible modules. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's this uh, okay. So this formula is not computable. So in the, what, what I mean, so there is a paper of Williamson with uh, George Lustig where they uh, wrote down an explicit uh, conjectural formula for SL three, and even that formula is not proved. What happens is, uh, so for SL3, so you have the alpha, and then, uh, okay, so this is like P. Everything is very easy here, but it is this. Uh, so for SL2, everything is, is easy, but for SL3, there are these uh, regions of high school <laughs> where it is not clear what. You, you mentioned when we had Berlin, there was P to the end, and it was related to uh, quantum groups. That's right, uh, yes. That's right. Okay, and now uh, say I consider a quantum group with root affinity of order six. Right, so in that case, uh, no, it's not related. You cannot obtain. So what you can do, you can uh, take characteristic to be one of the prime divisors. So if you have more than one prime divisor, you can take characteristic to be one of the prime divisors and you can uh, specialize uh, to positive characteristic and you will still get a quantum group. But root of unity will be of order where this divisor is thrown out. Yeah. Those are not symmetric categories, they are braided. But otherwise, this construction is perfectly good. Okay.